Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live stream, Structure versus Function. Super important concept to understand and grasp during your rehabilitation process if you have spinal conditions, back pain, leg pain, disc bulges from the neck all the way down to the lower back. I will emphasize the lower back and disc bulges today. For those of you that haven't met me, my name is Dr. Walter Salubra. I'm a corrective care chiropractor in Vaughan, Ontario, Canada. If you're a current subscriber of my channel, welcome again. I thank you for being a subscriber. And if you're brand new, do click subscribe right now so you don't miss out on the weekly content that I put out for you. Today, I want to talk about structure versus function. I'm going to show you why it's important, why structure should be corrected first before any function is actually corrected. I'll even demonstrate and take you through a process so you can actually believe it yourself as well. I'll give you some examples with my spine models. I'm going to go through some questions that I got asked on my channel, and then I'll open up to live Q&A. And if you can hear me okay, do give me a thumbs up right now in the chat box. The chat box is open. If you have any questions, leave them in the chat box. I will scroll through them and get to them. And if you catch us on the replay later on, do leave your questions in the comment section below. Thank you for giving thumbs up that you're hearing this. If you're on live now, hashtag live in the chat box. If you're catching this in the replay, hashtag replay in the comments below. Let's do this. So we need to focus on structure versus function. One of the common biggest mistakes that I see in my patients that come to my office, this is my office right here. This is the front area of my office. My rooms are here and where I adjust people, examine people, x-ray people. Uh, I'm a corrective care chiropractor. So one of the common mistakes that I see people that they land themselves in, and it's not their fault. They've been misled, misguided, misdirected. Perhaps the experts they went to just had a limited um, uh, um, a knowledge base, experience base. But one of the biggest problems is that, that patients that have major pain syndromes related to disc bulges, leg pain, back pain, hip pain, neck pain, arm pain, numbness, tingling, things that limit them in their day-to-day -day activities with their bending, moving, standing, sitting, sleeping, simple day-to-day -day activities, not to mention work and, and play and recreation, going to the gym, having fun, spending time with your family. These things limit people. And one of the things that, that, that I see is that patients tell me that they went to the therapist, went to some doctor, went to some specialist, and the first thing they did was they got them into some functional rehabilitation exercises. They can barely move, and they're getting them into functional rehabilitation exercises. So they're working on restoring function. What that means is strength, movement, abilities, things like that, right? Before any structure was actually either assessed or addressed in the correction process. Now, there is a place for functional rehabilitation. We do add it in our treatment programs. If you see my channel, there's a lots of different types of exercises for the back and the neck and the legs and the arm, but there's a place for them. What we need to focus on is assessing the structure of the spine. We're talking about spinal conditions. Assess the structure of the spine, determine if it's close to ideal alignment or not, and if it's not, how is it related to the patient's individual pain problem, complaint, presenting symptoms, MRI results, and so forth? And then what do we do to correct it, okay? So let's demonstrate first what normal structure is of the spine, okay? So there's two things you look at when, when there's structure. There's posture, and then there's spinal alignment, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to back up so you can see this, okay? So I'm going to back up a bit over here. So normal, <clears throat> so and I'm going to try to yell on top of my lungs so you can see me, hear me from the microphone. So normal line of the spine, now this is a model, so it's a bit been used and abused, but normal line of the spine is straight from the front, straight from the front. So on an x-ray, the alignment is straight like an arrow from the front. There's 24 movable bones, this in the middle, spinal cord sits on the inside, nerves out come, from, come out from either end, they go to all your body parts. The spinal column, the hard bones of the spine are designed to protect your spinal cord. Your spinal cord is a connection from your brain to your entire body. All of your body's functions are connected to your brain, body functions like stomach, um, heart, lungs, your healing, your repair systems, your hormonal systems, everything's connected and controlled through the brain. So the brain is protected by the skull, the bones of the spinal column protect the spinal cord. So it's super important that the structure is aligned ideally so that the spinal cord is not being tensioned, tethered, or stretched and causing a whole bunch of other problems, okay? So from the side, from the side, the spine has normal curves. <clears throat> These um, have been, been uh, classified in different ways. So in research, we know that the neck curve will be here. The neck curve is called the cervical lordosis. It's the shape of a circle. It approximates the geometric shape of a circle. So if you can imagine a circle being drawn like this, that would be a segment of the circle. 
the middle back. So there's seven bones in the cervical spine. Okay, I'm going to get into the structure versus function in a moment, but you need to know where ideal normal is first. The middle part over here, there's 12 thoracic vertebra. If you can imagine, this approximates the shape of an ellipse, an elongated ellipse. So an ellipse would be something like that. It's an elongated circle. It approximates that. The lumbar spine over here, you see it's also rounded. That also approximates the shape of an ellipse, a little bit more of a shorter, stubbier ellipse, more curve at the bottom, okay? The thoracic has more curve at the top. And then in the cervical spine, it's more curve in the center, okay? So it's kind of a uniform curve, actually, okay? So that's the shape of the, the spine, okay? So that's the normal alignment. Posture, it's gonna be hard to show this, but I'll try. So posture, normal ideal posture, head over sternal, uh, sternal uh, episternal notch, and then this right over the middle of the rib cage, over the pubic bone, right? So down the center. From the side, ear, shoulder, hips, knees, and ankles line up. So we have posture as a structural observation, and spine, okay, spine. So spine is assessed by x-ray, posture is assessed by photographs or postural visual observation, okay? So why is it important to correct structure before function? So let's show you some examples of bad structural distortions of the spine and how they contribute to conditions like back pain, neck pain, arm, uh, arm numbness tingling, leg sciatica, numbness tingling, and also disc bulges, okay? So if we have, let's see, I'll just use the lower back as an example. Let's say the lower back, right? We know it should be elliptical in shape, more but more curve at the bottom, flatter at the top, should be straight like this. What if there is less of a curve? So now it's alardotic or there's a straight lumbar spine, straight. That will create abnormal loads on the discs, cause them to wear and tear and damage over time, eventually cause annular tears and disc bulges. And when they irritate these nerves, will trigger leg pain leg pain, numbness, tingling, weakness in the legs. If these nerves go to the organ systems, um, actually they do go to organ systems, but if they're damaged even further, they can irritate the function of organ systems like the bladder, bowel, or colon, okay? And the sex organs, okay? So um, that would be an example of an abnormal distortion, okay? Sometimes the spine could be overbent, hyperlordosis, okay? The thoracics, very common. So there could be a straightening of the thoracic spine, not good. There can be a rounding of the thoracic spine, that kyphosis, okay? There's a hump over here. That causes the head position to go forward. The head position may be flattened out. That's another partial distortion. And this is all what's called the sagittal plane, this plane here, okay? Now, what if there's combinations of lateral distortions, rotations, head tilts? There's multitude of these combinations. So why is this important? Well, first of all, the abnormal alignment will stress the tissues, like the discs, the, the ligaments, the muscles, distort them, and cause irritation, inflammation, pain signals. When they irritate the nerves, will trigger neurologic symptoms, numbness, tingling, and other things like reflex problems or muscle weakness. So how does this relate? Okay, so that relates to the clinical condition, clinical presentation. Now, why is it important to correct structure before function? Let me demonstrate and follow along. Okay, so if you're watching live, hashtag live in the comments. If you're watching the replay, comment replay in the comments below under the video, okay? Hashtag live in the chat, comment and replay in the video after it's posting, after the live. So a very common presentation, forward head, forward head position and hunching of the back. So that would look like this, okay? Let's fix this here. That would look like, like this, okay? So follow along. Let's say that you're like this, okay? Normal is like this, okay? So in the normal position, head over shoulders, bring your head back, turn your head as far as you can, Turn your head as far as you can. Pay attention to how far you can rotate the head, okay? So head over shoulders, pull it back. Turn as far as you can. Follow along as long as it doesn't cause any pain, because I ask you a question in a moment. Turn as far as you can, okay? See how far you went. Now, do this now. Bring the head forward, okay? So bring it forward, round the back, okay? So bring it forward. You're distorting your posture on purpose. We're going to do an, a, 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 a pra, um an activity here, okay? So now it's forward. Now try to rotate in the forward position. Do you get more rotation or less rotation? Comment, please, in the chat box. Let me know your findings. If you're in the forward position, accentuating it on purpose, are you getting more rotation, more function, or less function? Does it feel more comfortable or less comfortable? Let me know right now in the chat box. I know there's a delay, so I'll wait for that, okay? So compare normal posture rotation to bad posture, 
structural distortion rotation. Okay, you will find, and I'm waiting for the comments to come through, that in the bad structural distortion, your functional ability to rotate and move is limited and also does not feel comfortable. It shows you that the, the distortion of the actual alignment of your posture and spine will affect the function of the movement. So does it make sense for someone to start working on, you know, range of motion and strengthening and stretching when they're in this distorted postural position, distorted structural position without actually having to correct the structure first? Tell me if that makes sense. Does it make sense to you? So Hussein said there's less function. It's bad posture. That's right. So does it make sense to correct functionally strengthening mobility, flexibility? Those are functional exercises in the bad position. Does it make sense? It doesn't. It doesn't because there's less movement in there due to a structural limitation. Let me give you another example, okay? So that's physical, right? That's th the physical structure, the physical posture, right? What about physiology, organ system function? Watch this, okay? So again, normal posture, accentuate, demonstrate a normal posture. Go through the motion if you can do it, okay? Take a deep breath in. Lung capacity, air filling into the lungs, normal posture. Now, accentuate the bad posture position, round the shoulders, hunch over like this, head forward, take a deep breath in. Which one gives you a deeper, more inhalation of breathing and breath and air? Is it the good posture? Let me know in the, in the chat box. Good posture or bad posture? Round the shoulders, flex forward. Which one is deeper breathing function, deeper respiration function? Good posture. Thank you. That's right. There's no way you can have deep breathing, unlabored breathing, normal breathing physiology if you're in a structural distortion with rounded shoulders, compressed rib cage, and rounded back. So again, you'll see that structure dictates function. And those are just some examples. Okay, we're not going to get into other areas, right? So I just showed you some two examples of how structure dictates function. So if someone now has weakness in their back, um, their limited flexibility, their tight muscles, they have um, limited mobility, whether it's range of motion or be able to function in their day-to-day -day activities, does it make sense if they have a structural distortion on the spine, right, on the spine, to go right into the functional exercises, okay? Does it? Absolutely not, okay? Now, there is a place for them, okay? In my process, we add it later on in our program, okay? But there's a place for it. So we want to focus on structural correction first. Structure versus function because structure dictates function. Structure dictates function. I want to read this, this one um, comment that I got by Tom four days ago on my channel. Okay. He says this, I've been dealing with L5S1 for one and a half years, which led to severe sciatica. I had surgery 12 weeks ago and now experiencing sciatica in the opposite leg when I drive. After hearing multiple, in, in capital letters, multiple, multiple, okay, professionals telling me to stretch, bridge, etc. Not one professional told me about structure before function. I don't get why I hear different things from different professionals. After hearing this, I feel like I just wasted my time with all this, all this time. I've been listening to this channel, which is Dr. Walter Slubro's channel, my channel, for a bit now, and it makes sense. I'm not a chiropractor by any means. However, after listening to many videos in the past, and especially this one, I feel like I've wasted precious recovery time. I don't live that far from your office. However, I feel like it would, it would help me dearly to have an, uh, an appointment with you. Great work, great videos, very informative. Thank you, Dr. Walter, for your hard work in educating everyone. It's not about me. I just want you to understand that many people are frustrated, as I am, when they go through the ringer of different treatments and therapies, right? All kinds of medicines and injections, and no one ever addressed the structural correction of their spine and posture if it's necessary. If it's not necessary, it's not necessary. But most time it is necessary and that's the purpose of this video so if you found that useful let me know in the comments right now in the chat box if you find this later useful in the replay let me know in the replay before if you have any questions do let me know because i will answer some questions okay so now the next question i get is um how do you how do you start correcting structure you know if you're not talking about functional correction how you start correcting structure so let me give you some concepts okay so the the method that i use is called corrective chiropractic care. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. 
The method that I use is called corrective chiropractic care. The technique that I use is called chiropractic biophysics, CBP for short. I'm a certified and trained um, chiropractic biophysics doctor here in Vaughan, Ontario, Canada. And this technique is backed up by over 300 research peer-reviewed publications and it's counting, okay? Many of these are, are biomechanics um, um, studies, groundbreaking foundational biomechanics studies and spinal um, alignment studies. Some of them are a randomized clinical studies. Some of them are non-randomized clinical studies and many of our case studies, systematic reviews and so forth, x-ray guidelines, lots of research behind this technique, okay? And um, th this is the concept. So we look at, assess the patient. So we do their, their history, look at their case review, MRIs and all reports. We take x-rays of, of, of the patient. Now, check this out. If someone comes in with a low back complaint, right? I don't just hone in and pigeonhole into the low back. I don't just do that. You're an in, you're a full human being with a full spine, 24 bones stacked up one on top of each other, right? Straight from the front, three curves from the side. So we x-ray the full spine, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, front and side. And then we piece all those pictures together and get a full spine x-ray image from the front and the side. And it needs to match ideal normal straight from the front or the back, ideal normal curves from the side, circular cervical curve, lordosis, elliptical kyphosis, thoracic curve, elliptical kypho, uh, lordosis of the lumbar curve, okay? And also this part of the spine should be over this part of the spine. So C, C1 over T1 or C2 over C7, T1 over T12, and then uh, L1 or T12 over S, S2, okay? And then from the front should be down the center. So what that means posturally is head over shoulders, shoulders over hips, uh, hips over knees, knees over ankles. So if someone is doing this, right? See if I can show you. Okay, hold on. Okay. So if someone's doing this, okay, you got me there. Okay. That's postural abnormalities of their posture. Okay. Or they may be like this. These are posture shifts. We want to make sure that that posture presentation matches the x-rays. If it does it, it requires different approaches in corrective care, which we could do. But most time, we want to be sure that it matches. We want to, most time it does match the x-ray and sometimes it doesn't. So now let's see, posture, head is forward, spine, head is forward, loss of lordosis. We now we need to add some structural correcting techniques to bring that back into the ideal position. So CBP has three prongs to this, okay? There is mirror image um, exercises, postural correcting exercises. It works on the muscular activation, retraining to hold the posture in place, repetition. Then there is adjustments, mirror image adjustments or postural correcting adjustments, place the person into the mirror image position. And then we do some taps on their uh, body to help enhance the proprioceptors, mechanical receptors that feed information to the brain about position, retrain the neurology of that bad position. We can also do mirror image adjustments on the table or with instruments by hand on the table with instruments. And then there's traction. So traction would require, so if someone's head is forward, we get them to lie on the fulcrum point, right? Get the head to bend. So there's home traction devices. These are some of them over here that we have. So like this, okay? They're in boxes, but these are some of the devices we have. They're called spinal uh, orthotics. And then there's traction equipment in the office. So there's exercise, there is adjustments, and then there's traction. And that's how we help improve the structure of the spine. These are a specific protocol we follow over the course of 10 to 12 weeks, three times a week, sometimes twice a week, depending on the person's necessity. And we start with an assessment of um, x-ray and posture, and then we do an outcome assessment at 12 weeks with x-ray and posture and see where we're at. Some people get great results in the first 12 weeks. Some people need more correction thereafter or maintenance. Okay. So that's what we do. We start with structural correction, first in that methodology. And then along the way, as the pain is decreasing, inflammation is decreasing, mobility is increasing, the patient's a lot happier, right? They're functioning, living their life a lot better. They're back at work. They're back at play with their kids. They're doing the things they want to do, ride a bike, go to the gym, uh, play badminton, tennis, uh, exercise, swim, whatever it is that they want to do, right? They're now living and resuming their life. Then now we start to give functional exercises to support the structural correction. And that's when I get into planks and bridges and uh, dead bug and um, curl ups and different muscular strength and exercises for the core 
uh, uh, abdominal muscles and the back muscles, flexibility and mobility. So we add that along the way. Some patients do it in the office, some patients do it at home. Okay, so we do add the functional activities and, and then um, and on top of the structural, okay? So that covers structure versus function. If you found that useful, let me know right now in the chat box. I see some questions coming through. If um, you, on the replay, let me know in the comments below. If this is a new concept to you, let me know. If you want to learn more about this stuff, let me know. I'll add it into my YouTube videos, the uploaded videos. And um, if you've heard this before, also let me know. Also, if you've tried something that hasn't worked, I'm really curious to know what you've tried for therapy that has not worked. If you try something that has worked, also let me know because people like to get information for others that are just like them that they've been through, okay? So I'll go through some questions in a moment. I want to read one more, actually two more um, pre-written um, pre, um, questions here that I got from my channel. And then I'll go through a live question and answer right now. And uh, so you have some few minutes to do this and this is going to end soon. So if you have a question, do put it in right now, okay? And then um, in the replay, if you're catching those replay, then add your question in the comment section. I do my best to answer questions as well um, behind the scenes. Okay. So next one I have over here. So this is by Lucky, number two over here. Okay. Lucky says, this was four days ago also. Can disc bulges heal by exercise? I have disc desiccation, mild disc herniation at L405, and disc extruded at L5S1. So those are serious disc injuries and disc damages. And I've seen many people comment on my channel that they've done exercises and their disc condition has improved. So their pain has improved and their limitations have improved and they're back to normal, what they consider normal. So I believe that there are some circumstances that some, some um, exercises will help someone recover from disc injuries, right? And I've seen that many times people tell me that. There is always that 10 to 20 to 30% that needs some extra help. So if exercises, if you try them, has not solved your problem, um, at home, then look for help. Okay. So that's very important. And there's different types of help. There's chiropractic care, there's corrective chiropractic care, there's physiotherapy, there's acupuncture, there's of course medicines and injections for relief. Um, you know, those are not necessary sometimes. Okay. And then the next question I asked before I go to the live questions, the third one over here is by um, Hawa. And uh, Hawa says, thank you for this video. This is a pre-recorded video. Um, I've been struggling with low back pain for seven years now. And I, and I take an MRI last two months. The results say I have L405 disc bulge. And now I have crazy pain down my left leg. I've been doing these exercises, but the pain is not going away. I can't sit or stand for some times. And I'm really uh, in pain. Please, what's your advice? So um, again, there's not specific advice for this person or anyone in particular. It's just general information. So you need to talk to your doctor, talk to your therapist, talk to your specialist and see what's appropriate for you. But Here's the deal. If you have been suffering, seven years is a long time to suffer. Do you agree? I think so, right? I think a day is a long time to suffer in my experience. So seven years is a long time. Finally, as an MRI has a diagnosis now, now the, the thing is I know what the problem is, but what do I do? So something has to be done. Seven years is now chronic, chronic inflammation, chronic scar tissue. Something has to be done. This is when you need some professional care, corrective chiropractic care, physiotherapist, acupuncturist, massage therapist, multimodal, a combination of all those. So something needs to be done. So my recommendation is to get some treatment. If there's no, some countries don't have chiropractors, unfortunately, are not a wide variety or access to chiropractors. In Canada, where I am, there is. In the United States, there is. In Europe, there is. In some countries in Europe, uh, in Mexico, there's some. Uh, but many countries don't have many chiropractors, unfortunately. So if you don't have access to a chiropractor in your area, then go to something, someone else that has manual therapies that can help like physiotherapy. Okay. So um, that's my advice for someone that has chronic issues that just discovered what the problem is through an MRI, need to get some care sometimes. Okay. Awesome. If you find this useful and um, valuable, let me know right now in the chat. And of course, in the comments as well, I'm going to wrap this up in a few minutes. We went 27, about 25 minutes, actually. Um, and uh, I want to go through here. So um, we have a question. Uh, by Hussein. So uh, that's very true. X-ray time, they always ask to stay in the correct posture rather than taking the x-ray while we're in our usual posture. Wow, Hussein, that's amazing, amazing uh, comment. Um, and why do I know is because um, we have a standard way of setting up the patients for their x-rays. That's part of the things that we learn with chiropractic valve physics and ZVP. Why is that important? Because number one, I want to see what you're doing. You, the patient, right, is doing um, standing on two feet, not lying down on a table. We live on our feet, right, most of the time. And gravity acts on our posture when we're standing, on our feet standing. So I want to see what's happening to the body as we're standing. So I'll tell my patients, take a couple steps on the spot, close your eyes, stop in a position that you feel comfortable, and that's their natural position. From the front, same thing. So I get them to reset, reset, reset until they're in their natural position. 
And then from their natural position is where I x-ray all their segments, neck, mid back, low back. Okay. And then when we retake the x-rays, then we also get them to stand their natural idea, uh, natural normal, quote unquote normal fan position. And also there's certain ways in certain places that we aim the x-rays to make sure we're all in, in, in the right anatomical spots so we can uh, compare it properly from beginning to um, outcome time, okay? Re-exam time. Great question and remark, Hussein. Thank you for that. Awesome. So I'm going to wait another one minute because there's a delay right now. Let me see how much of a delay there is. About 30 seconds or so. So um, there's one more question here. Okay, good. <clears throat> so keep, if the questions keep coming, I keep talking. When the questions end, then we'll call it end, okay? So, okay, Jose, let me just get this. <clears throat> what does this mean? L405 mild disc desiccation and and uh, and height loss, small diffuse disc bulge, 11 millimeter central annular fissure, 13 times 4 millimeter TV AP central disc protrusion, and minimal bilateral facet arthropathy, resulting in minimal canal and minimal bilateral neural foraminal stenosis. Can you give me some clarity? So, okay, so here's the deal. I'm not here to diagnose you. I'm not here to give you um, advice or prognosis or treatment, um, but I'll just go over the terminology, okay? So this is a terminology review. So we look at um, disc desiccation, okay? So disc desiccation, okay? Let me show, I always like to compare it to normal, okay? So normal disc, okay, normal disc. Go into my stream. Normal disc, nice and wide. Nice annular tears around, uh, sorry, annular fibers around here and the nucleus pulposus, okay? So, normal disc. This one, not normal, okay? See the difference? Wide disc spaces, narrow disc spaces, or the height of the disc is loss. So, desiccation means dried up. So, a disc is made of fibrocartilage material, tough outer layer, a fibrocartilage with a nucleus pulposus, a jelly-like material on the inside, very strong. 90% of the content of the disc is water. So when the disc degenerates, it dries up, okay? It dries up. So desiccation means the disc has dried up. Look at the difference, okay? Right there, okay? And you see there as well. So that's what desiccation means, okay? And then, of course, then we look at the, um, so annular fissures mean annular tears. So examples of that would be, you know, right there. So you see how that's moving in there? Those are annular tears right there compared to that. Those annular fibers are intact, okay? So the fissures are some kind of tear. And then um, there is um, a disc protrusion. So I don't have a good example of that. But, um, you know, there's a disc bulge over there protruding, okay? So this protrusion is a disc, uh, an enhanced disc bulge. And then uh, they're looking at foraminal nearing. So foramen, this is very important. This is very common. So the nerve comes out of this opening here called the foramen or the neural foramen. You don't ever want that to narrow, ever, 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 okay? How does it narrow? When the discs thin out. So the discs thin out and there's degeneration narrowing that hole. So now the discs, the, the nerves are compromised, neurologically compromised through that structure, the degeneration. So that's neural foraminal narrowing, okay? And then uh, sometimes there's canal stenosis. So uh, again, central canal stenosis now, in the lumbar spine, you're not going to have the spinal cord. The spinal cord ends at L1, L2. Inside the lumbar spine is the cauda equinus, the branch of the spinal cord. So this is not a lumbar example. And this is more thoracic. But there should be a canal, right, central canal, and should be a lot of space for those nerves to exist and also the spinal cord to exist in the upper levels. When that canal narrows because of this bulge protruding centrally backwards, it will narrow that canal. And, of course, um, there's a lot of space and fluid in the lumbar spine, so the, 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 the um, cauda nerves are protected. But in the thoracic and cervical spine, there's less space, so any protrusions back towards the spinal cord can obviously compromise that. Big, big disc bulges protruding back into the spinal canal of the um, of the uh, uh, lower back lumbar spine. If it's massive protrusion, can affect the cauda equina and then cause massive cauda equina type syndromes, which require surgical intervention. Okay, that's very rare, but something to be aware of. Okay. All right, we got uh, one more comment here. Seno, thank you for your comment. I love how you're teaching. Very clear. I appreciate that. Um, gets me excited to, to teach more and more. Okay, awesome. Very informative. Thank you. I'm glad you found that useful, Jose. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stay live here for another few minutes. We went about 30 minutes. And um, I appreciate the comments and the love. 
and any super chats goes towards supporting the channel and getting more videos out to you. So um, I love doing these lives. Uh, again, it's hard for me to schedule them. Sometimes I used to schedule them on a weekly basis and some people came on, some people did not come on. I, I like, I'm a spur of the moment guy. So I'll have pre-recorded videos that come out. So if, if you're new, subscribe, get those videos. And sometimes I'll get these live question and answers based on the inspiration that I see either on my channel, on my comments that I get like this, what I go through with my patients and so forth, okay? Um, and um, some, something to if, um, so in Canada, the United States, there's a lot of chiropractors that do corrective care. So if you're looking for a corrective care style chiropractor, chiropractic style physics style chiropractor, um, I can send you a directory uh, of these doctors, an online directory. Some are certified, some are not, some are trained, some are certified. Most in the United States, some in Canada, some in other parts of the world. Just comment. So not, not in the chat box, okay? Not in the chat box, but in the comment section of the video below the comment section, say, can you send me the directory of chiropractic file physics docs? And I'll send that to you in the comment section. And then hopefully you can find someone in your area that does this, okay? So Jose asks, um, so how does chiropractic care help with? Okay, so I discussed this about 10 minutes ago in this live video, Jose. So once the video ends, the live stream, just go back, rewatch it, and you'll find that part. I demonstrate with the spine model and everything. So go ahead, go back and watch that. And then there's traditional lumbar sacral, sorry, transitional lumbar sacral anatomy with sacralization of L5 resulting in pseudoarthrosis of the left and right transverse process of the sacrum. So big, big words. Uh, basically what that means is that, um, so there should be normal, five normal vertebra of the lumbar spine. When one of the vertebra assumes the shape of the sacrum and it's connected, it's called sacralization of that lumbar vertebra. And it basically means, so it should be a free free moving vertebra, should not be attached to the sacrum. But when that actually uh, attaches to the sacrum over here, it just looks more complete with this, okay? So when the lumbar spine attaches to the sacrum and it articulates with that, that's called it a, a fake or a, not a real, but a pseudo arthrosis or pseudo um, 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 the articulation. Okay. So that's basically a transitional segment. Uh, those most of the time are incidental findings. There are some clinical implications with that, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. Okay. But we do find those, uh, they're pretty common. I forget the exact, um, prevalence, maybe 20% of the population will have some sort of transitional segment. Okay. Sometimes they're clinical factors. Sometimes they're not. It depends on what's happening with the individual. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Thank you for being on the live today. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, again, if you're brand new to my channel, if this is your first video ever, congratulations for making it to this video because it's a lot of good content in this video. Go watch my other videos, subscribe, tap the notification button. And uh, if you're an existing subscriber, I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you for being part of this community. I'm never going to stop doing this. I love doing this. And um, um, I just want more people to understand corrective chiropractic care, um, non-conservative, um, sorry, conservative, um, non-medical ways of treating the spine without surgery. You know, these are great options. We've helped many, many patients in my office here in Vaughan, Ontario, Canada. And I've referred, I've referred hundreds and hundreds of people to chiropractors all over the United States, Canada, and around the world uh, through my channel. So this mission is not just an educational channel. This is really getting people um, to understand chiropractic, corrective chiropractic care, that they can have a normal life again. Um, um, you're not going to ever have a spine like you had when you were 20 years old, right? But, you know, if you're, if you're an elderly with degenerated spine, but at least have some type of normal life again and hope and and know that the body can heal when you're directed in the right direction. So really, it's really about hope and leading people in the right direction. So thank you for being part of this live. Thank you for being part of this channel. And I'll see you again on the next stream or video. Ciao, ciao from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Vaughn, Ontario, Canada.